and welcome to Stop Booking Around. I'm John Clonshaw and I'm joined again by another special guest. Today I've got Emma Gein. Now Emma is the author of The Many Cells of Catherine North and we met in 2016 at Edgelit and she ran a workshop about writing about non-humans, writing about animals and how to do that effectively in your writing. You wrote this book that was about, I think the term used was phenomenauts which is the experience of another animal. So you you go into the bodies of these other creatures, and I seem to remember you had, like, the experience of being a seal, which I thought was really cool, and, um, like, insects and things like that. And I think for writers, it's really difficult to get past our humanness. Even when you're not actually writing about another species that actually exists, and you're sort of creating your own, and you have strange aliens and that kind of thing I think it is really hard to kind of break away from the point of view that we kind of inhabit every day and I think one of my slight bugbears is that most non-human kind of characters that we encounter in fiction are basically humans in a sort of strange bodysuit and it's a kind of big question of how do you break away from that Um, and I guess to a certain extent do you want to because I think in some, some senses if you write a character that is completely non-human it can be sort of hard to empathize or people might not be interested in it so I think that might be another interesting thing to discuss of whether we truly do want to represent the non-human in fiction but yeah that was when I was sort of embarking on my novel I guess I was kind of engaged with those kinds of questions of what it would be like to experience other bodies and other kind of realities that are kind of come to us we would come to the character through the prism of another body and what that did to her and her psychology it was an absolutely fascinating read the way the way it worked and you know the way you spoke about just how many nerves a particular creature has got and how they uh, perceive things with senses that maybe we don't even have and i'm just kind of wondering like how do you start with the initial research of that It's a really hard one in the sense that I think I think I certainly went into this book with the awareness that I was it was it was in some ways an impossible task that I was setting myself. Um, And so, you know, it's very, very nice to have people say that they felt that I succeeded because I think in some ways, you know, I, I kind of only made a small stab towards something that's pretty much impossible but I mean just in terms of the practicalities of sort of making those small steps that kind of are possible I think I think a good start is to really kind of read as much of the research as you can like understand what their senses are understand sort of what their body is and how they can move and um with my book, I kind of slightly cheated um, and gave myself an easier task in the sense that it was very much about human consciousness in the body of another animal. So I didn't have to sort of go into the complexities of what kind of other thoughts or cultures would arise through um, creatures that um, inhabit different bodies. But certainly starting with, I think starting with the materiality of a creature, I think is a really important thing to do for whether you're trying to write you know um, other animals that exist or kind of aliens on other planets because in a sense who we are is very much determined by our sort of fleshy realities how much does the physiology kind of inform character and inform decisions about the story i think i guess to a certain sense the answer to that's going to depend on what you're writing and what you're aims are as I was saying in some ways I was slightly cheating because the person who was inhabiting the bodies of my novel was very much human though a human who had been sort of impacted on by inhabiting these bodies but I guess if you're writing like a character that's you know they've they've always inhabited a certain body then I guess in a sense that physiological aspect has got to change everything really and I guess then that's sort of tied into issues of kind of what their environment is and why why that why they have that particular physiology. Because in a sense, I think a creature is always sort of not only you know intimately part of their own body, but that body is going to be kind of intimately tied into a certain environment of an, and adapted to that. So I guess in some ways as well, if you're writing say an alien, 
there is, I guess, a certain question of so do you start with environment and then kind of create a body from that and then create a culture from that? Or do you start with um, a certain body and then sort of say, OK, well, what what sort of environment would this sort of uh, kind of evolved to and what kind of culture would come from that? Or even you can start with culture and then go backwards to say body or, and then environment. So I guess it also depends on what you what your aims are and what your process is. I guess um, that's probably not a very helpful helpful answer, um, but I, I think so long as you're aware aware of the, the, the sort of entanglement of those three things of sort of culture, body, and environment, and how they're very much intimately connected and entangled, then I think that's always a good place to start. When you did your research for you know these different animals i mean was, was there a point where you read something that was just like wow i need to use that you know is there, is there anything that really kind of captured your imagination i guess reading about other animals is really great because they're incredibly they're incredibly familiar and yet incredibly strange so i think um there were kind of lots of moments where i was like this is just really exciting so like um octopuses um they have quite a lot of they're, so that most of their this has been sorry this has been a while since I've I've read this so I, I'm not going to have the exact figures but basically most of their sort of nervous system sort of all kind of I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily called central because basically in a human we have our central nervous system which is kind of our brain and sort of slight bits of the spinal cord which is sort of very much that's where our cognition is and it's very much sort of based in our head and then we have sort of obviously nerves going out through the rest of the body which sends sort of information back to the brain but kind of all the sort of central kind of executive decisions are made by the brain whereas in an octopus there's a lot of decision making that's sort of located in their tentacles so sort of tentacles will kind of have sort of their own autonomy and their own volition so if I was an octopus sort of wandering along the sort of floor like my brain my main sort of brain would, might think, oh, I want to go this way, I want to go that way. Whereas, you know, as, as I went along, my tentacles might be sort of picking up the things by their own accord and sort of, you know, flinging them around. Or, I mean, it's obviously kind of very difficult then as a kind of writer deciding what that experience would actually be like, because it could be that in some ways it's a false idea to say that, you know, an octopus would feel more distant or as if their limbs were not so much under their own control as a human does, because it's quite hard to sort of translate that kind of, you know, the breakdown of the neurology into actual experiences. But it was certainly sort of something that I read when I thought, well, that would be a very weird thing to write about. And I suppose as well, in terms of writing things like description and everything like that, I suppose with the idea of scale, I mean, obviously uh, a tiny lizard is going to have a different experience of the world and, than a giraffe for example yeah I think I think one of the things kind of I've been very interested in recently is how much that kind of bodily idea of scale and those senses impacts on all literature like even this idea of like there's a you know kind of this idea of like third person omniscient narrators like it's supposed to be not attached to any particular character and the idea is that it's sort of disembodied as well but then when you kind of really look at just about any any book with that kind of thing in it's always very much grounded in a particular kind of authorial body like you know to say something is small or big or hot or cold or hard or soft that's always implying a particular type of body one of the big things I wanted to write about that in my novel is because I think it sort of shows how much our reality and what we think of as sort of unignorable facts like you know something is very big or small it's you know entirely dependent on sort of our own materiality what our body is like the idea of, of empathy and writing and and you know this is obviously something that's really important to you and i'm just wondering how you improve that for writers i mean what what are the kind of things you think we can do i know the the workshop i ran at as you came to i was sort of getting people to do some slightly strange laughing and role playing as other animal bodies and i think that was 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 more or less successful for various <laughs> different people but I think sometimes when you are faced with such a daunting and in basic you know I, I think it is an impossible task of trying to sometimes you know understand what it's really like to have an entirely different body I think sometimes moving your body and sort of trying to interact and work with the world as closely as another being would can be quite a good way of sort of getting into that mindset so um 
I had quite a few rather embarrassing times in the swimming pool when I was trying to work out what it would be like to be a polar bear of this kind of like splashing and paddling around like what I thought a polar bear would be how it would like to be that so I think sometimes a good way of kind of closing that sort of empathy gap is to sort of get as close to experience that kind of material situation as you can I mean because in a sense it's difficult I won't I won't kind of bore you with um basically my um 5,000 word literature review of my PhD on this but nobody agrees exactly what empathy is but I mean in certainly in some definitions it's sort of based on this idea of sort of that sort of empathy in some ways comes from can come from sort of bodily mimicking so you know it's the kind of like, you know when you're kind of with like a really good friend and you sort of sit down you'll sort of start you know if they lean back you'll lean back a bit or um you know sort of research shows that you know often people will start kind of breathing in tune and that kind of thing there's a sort of idea in some ways that sort of understanding another person is in part based through bodily means so there's this idea in some ways that because emotions are bodily experiences in a sense if you're mimicking another person's bodily experiences then you're going to in some way share some of their emotions too not everyone agrees that that's what empathy is but that's certainly a strong theme so yeah certainly trying to get as close to that bodily situation as possible can be a really good way of getting into that character's mindset i suppose you know we're talking about animals and aliens but i mean this can easily go for people and the idea of experiencing other cultures and people who are different to you i mean it's it's this thing of like trying to understand and not just taking it from your context and your perspective and actually trying to experience it through different lenses if you can and i guess the kind of great thing about writing about other people is that you can go and talk to them and ask them and get them to feedback on your how you've written things um so i guess the, the problem is i guess with writing aliens or animals is that well, I mean, I guess the great thing is that you're not going to get any kind of angry letters. But I mean, um, hello, bear leaving a bad review on Amazon. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. That explains so many of my one-star reviews. It is obviously very difficult to know how success success you're being, and there's, I guess, there's all sorts of moral questions as part of that as well. How right is it to speak for people who or speak for creatures or um, beings that don't have a voice? But yeah, obviously, the great thing about writing other cultures and things is that obviously the first thing of that situation is always to go and talk with people i'm not recommending people uh, go and sort of laugh out what it's like to be um you know well i guess, I guess to some extent i guess to a certain extent with some things it's basically method acting like it is it's obviously very dubious territory like how much i don't know I guess that kind of thing can very easily devolve into basically like blackface or something, but... (laughs) Yeah, it's it's when you're slipping into stereotypes. I think also that that kind of thing of somehow thinking, oh, I've experienced something a bit like this means I understand the whole perspective. Like, I know some people kind of get quite angry at those things, like, um, you know, those sleep outs, like saying, oh, we're going to understand what it's like to be a homeless person, so I'm going to go and, you know, of my own volition, go and decide to sleep on a pavement for one night. And it's like, I guess to a certain extent, that's going to give you a bit of an appreciation of how horrible it is, but you're never going to fully understand because of that, because I mean, I guess you, you've chosen to do that and you know that it's only one night and it will be, be over soon. So... I guess it's the kind of thing where that kind of thing can be helpful, but always always has to be taken with like a very, very, very large pinch, maybe like a whole tablespoon full of salt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I've read quite a few novels now with, you know, uplifted animals and things like that. I mean, is, is there any that really inspired you? So there was, I don't know, this wasn't one that inspired me, but there was, I can certainly recommend a book which like came out I think a little bit on after one mine and it was it was so painful to read because it had done it so much better than I had and that was Pax by Sarah Pennyfacker that's um a children's book but it's kind of writing about a boy and his fox and it's very good at kind of getting into the fox's senses and that kind of thing you know all the classics are kind of worth a look but I think I think it's difficult because you know even though I've said you know it's an impossible task and it's very hard to do there's even though I'm always aware of that, there's always a little part of me that's sort of disappointed when I read kind of books because obviously I'm asking the impossible of them. When you were coming up then, I mean, what 
books were inspiring you? I mean, I guess, you know, there are there are lots of writers who inspire me, but it's always kind of quite hard to say, you know, how you know a particular book kind of came from being inspired by this particular writer, if you see what I mean. In a very nerdy way, The Many Cells of Catherine North was sort of inspired by a bunch of sort of philosophy books on um so the phenomenology of perception by Merleau Ponty, which is very much about the kind of ways in which the body shapes our consciousness and how we experience the world. So in in, in a kind of very nerdy, geeky way, in some ways it was it was inspired very much by non fiction. I mean obviously you in terms of craft and that kind of thing it sort of comes from a whole bunch of lots of other writers I really respect but it's sort of quite hard to sort of pinpoint you know this novel was the one that made me want to write that that's interesting the philosophy stuff because I mean when I was um, I mean to be honest I've not really done it with my novels but in with short stories and things I've got several which are like inspired by Derrida and things like that where it's trying to kind of get at this weird sense of erasure if you know what i mean i don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff but he's obsessed with this idea of the trace of something that's kind of not there and is there i don't know it's a bit bit of a weird one but that's something i've been trying to get at with some of my um sci-fi shorts and i think it's yeah it's interesting to kind of try and express ideas just having that inspiration is yeah it's a really interesting way to almost translate ideas between the philosophy and the story which is i think that's that's quite a un- underestimated thing i think particularly for short stories they're really great aren't they There's sort of so many every time i'm sort of sitting down to read like a book in that kind of line i'm basically just you know constantly making notes and margins about oh that would be a really great short story for this and that and never have time to actually write all of them but i mean i guess i should say that in terms of sort of anyone sort of starting out writing i think i'm not necessarily recommending using that as a process because I think I've sort of very much been through a process recently of realising that that kind of thing of starting with a sort of philosophical idea and then building a story around it is not done very often because it's a really bloody awful technique and <laughs> um, it, it means I've been sort of I've, from, with my first two books I think I basically ended up fighting for years in terms of trying to get the plot to fit to the idea because I'd started with the idea. So I think use that method with caution, I think, sort of better to kind of have a very general idea that inspires a bunch of sort of characters and emotions and plots and then sort of, you know, work them all ideas based in around that. Yeah. Otherwise you can just end up fighting forever trying to get <laughs> plot working with ideas. It's just a fucking nightmare. Yeah, well, I, th- I think this is why I had to go and uh, learn all the stuff about plot structure and narrative theory and things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And just kind of working out how I could weave a theme into a story without it being like, right, I, I really like this passage by Nietzsche. Let's go and yeah. write a story about that. You know, I think you can do it on a flash fiction when you in and out, but I think when you're getting into the longer pieces, I, I can't imagine how difficult that must be to kind of do that as a consistent thing unless you're just doing it naturally i kind of had a similar process of um you know kind of going okay i really need to go away and i mean stupid you know even though i've been in creative writing academia for quite some time now you i never actually learned how a plot actually works and i had to go away to script writers to actually sort of learn the basics of that so I think um, to a certain extent, like ideas can crush that kind of natural instinct people have for story sometimes. And I think it's probably better to let that natural instinct flow first and then sort of shape it with ideas later. I mean, just as just as a comparison, like, I've spent like I spent oh, like oh like five years fighting with my first novel, like draft after draft after draft, trying to make it work, um, just because trying to get the ideas and the plot to mesh whereas my third novel where I was like fuck it this is a really stupid idea I'm going to start with plot first I've written (laughs) the first third of it in like two months so it's plot first always yeah plot character yeah (laughs) yeah yeah character's probably the you know who who's your antagonist who's your protagonist and trying to work it out from there what's your conflict I very much believe that character is plot 
I'm hugely inspired by, um, you know, like John York's Into the Woods. I am reading that at the moment. I'm about 25% through it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like taking a shot of pure story, storyness. You know, how, this is, you know, the very basics of how story works, I felt. But yeah, he, he's very much of the idea that plot is basically, you know, a character needs something and meets some kind of resistance in the world that stops them getting that and often that's embodied by the antagonist who's in some ways reflective of what the protagonist needs and through kind of combating the antagonist they come to grow and absorb that part of themselves that they needed Um, and that's basically in some ways what he says plot is. I've been studying this for a few years now and a lot of story gurus basically say the same thing in different ways it all seems to be linked back to character and one that I found that's resonating with me at the moment I don't know if you're aware of um, Dan Harmon's story circle so he's the guy behind like community and Rick and Morty and things like that and (laughs) he's got a really kind of cool way of looking at the hero's journey you know the kind of three-act structure thing but really tying it into character development and it's it's very cool it's worth looking at and yeah I'll take a look can work really well for series particularly important for like fancy sci-fi stuff i guess how do you keep a a sort of series going when in some ways if you've already resolved your character issues that's a really difficult one you just give them lots of issues and have them (laughs) really really messed up characters yeah. yeah what's next for you then in terms of your writing i mean have you got any books on the way or anything like that i'm working on my third one which is i guess it's very much based in the here and now but there are giant sea monsters coming up and kind of crashing coastal towns but everyone is ignoring them so i guess continue my kind of rant about climate change and that kind of thing how we're destroying everything and everyone is just ignoring it i'll keep bringing this up on the podcast but i'm obsessed with um gene wolf's book of the new sun and these like continent-sized sea monsters in that that are waiting in the in the sidelines that don't really feature in the story much but they're always referred to i like the sea monsters that's <laughs> sea monsters are a thing i didn't realize this before i started writing it but people get strangely yeah they're a thing they're basically huge sized animals so like frogs that are covered in tumors or giant shrimp with fungal infections and that kind of thing but very 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 big <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> I was watching the, I think it was a Planet Earth thing and some of the things on that that were, um, what was it, like the Bobbit worm. I don't know if you've seen those oh, things. Freaky. I, oh, Bobbit worms. It's the fact that they, they sound like hobbits as well, like, ho- like hobbits in their com- comfy holes, like these Bobbit worms in their little holes in the seabed that they just yeah. <laughs> leap out and... <laughs> leaped out and, and I, was, I was thinking about how big they are and it's like my god these are the size of my son it's like <laughs> absolutely frightening i think my son's to blame because he's six and he, he loves the octonauts i don't know if you've ever <laughs> seen that program which is like i think it's meant to be some kind of science outreach program about undersea stuff for kids but there's anthropomorphic bears that pilot submarines and things so nice very very strange might might be up your alley i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah you sound, yeah yeah you, you got me with the, the bears piloting submarines <laughs> yeah and they um i think there's a, pi- a pirate cat as well and yeah so anyway <laughs> Where's the best place then to find you online? Where are your books? So you can find me at Emma C. Gein on Twitter or my books can be found on the Bloomsbury website or kind of Amazon if you want to use them. Still around in some waterstones. Yeah, so that's called The Many Selves of Catherine North. So remember, you can check out the Stop Booking Around book on Amazon Audible. It's available as a paperback as well. You can also follow me on the Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. If you've got any questions for the show, just get in touch. So until next time, cheerio. Cheerio.